Hello, saints. Peace, love, and grace in Christ Jesus be with all of you. Welcome from a frigid northeast. Today is 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Tonight is supposed to be minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Very cold, very cold. But today we're going to do a study. And in this study, Lord willing, we're going to discover, one of the things we're going to discover is who the saints are who will rule and reign with Christ Jesus on the earth for 1,000 years. Are they the Old Testament saints? Are they the body of Christ saints? Which saints are we talking about? Now, in order to answer this question, we need to look at three main things in God's Word. First, we're going to look at the prophetic program versus the mystery program. Second, we're going to take a look at the second coming of Christ Jesus and everything surrounding that. And third, we're going to look at the resurrection prophecies that are written to and for the Old Testament saints. Now, when I say Old Testament saints, I'm talking about also the saints which are considered the tribulation saints. Those that are going to be going through Daniel's 70th week that are going to be here on the earth to receive our Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and they're going to be ushered into the earthly kingdom okay so I'm, I'm talking about the Old Testament Saints uh, back we're all familiar with the Old Testament of God's Word and also the New Testament uh, which includes Hebrews through Revelation that speaks about the the uh, Daniel 70th week tribulation Saints all right now in 2 Timothy 2.15, we're all aware, and we've all seen this verse, but some of you may be new to all this, and so we're going to look at 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now in order to understand the Bible, God's word, you first must understand dispensations if it's the first time you've ever heard the word dispensations don't worry don't get excited it's not a big deal what are dispensations well simply dispensations is a word that describes how God has been dealing with mankind over the past 6,000 years in different ways in other words God's different administrations that he's been using over the course of 6,000 years in the past and the completion of 7,000 years on earth okay in fact there's seven different dispensations throughout the Bible quickly the first one is innocence and we're looking at Adam and Eve and mankind the second one is conscience again Adam and Eve and mankind third we have human government which involved Noah in the world. The fourth dispensation is promise, which involved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the promises, all the covenants that were committed and promised to Abraham. And the fifth one is the dispensation of law, which involved Moses, the commandments, and all the laws that God issued out through Moses to the nation of Israel. The sixth dispensation is grace, that's where we're at today. It was introduced through Paul. It was given to Paul by Jesus Christ. Paul didn't make this his gospel up one day. He he didn't he, he wasn't sitting under a tree and decided, you know, you know, today I think I think it's a good day to come up with a new gospel. That's not what he said. That's not what he thought. That's not what happened. What happened was Jesus Christ chose a Jew named Saul and there's a whole story behind the reason why he chose Saul but in this study we're not going to take a look at that reason we're going to look we're going to look at he chose Paul to be an apostle to the rest of the world outside of the nation of Israel the birth of the body of Christ began with the conversion of our apostle Paul and it involves us, the body of Christ, today. Now, the seventh dispensation is kingdom, which will involve the nation of Israel and Jesus Christ. The second thing you have to understand in order to understand the Bible is 
you have to rightly divide God's word. Now, what does rightly divide mean? Well, simply, rightly dividing God's word is asking the questions who, what, where, when, how, whenever you're studying the Bible. For example, when you read a passage in God's word, ask the question, who's speaking? Who's being spoken to? What's being said? The context of the passage. When in God's program or dispensation is this passage taking place in time? And how does it apply to us for today? Does it apply to the body of Christ? Does it apply to the nation of Israel? Or does it apply to both of us? Another way to look at right division is understanding what you're reading on a dispensational timeline. Okay? Now, you're going to see the importance of understanding dispensations and right division as we move along in this study. It's extremely important. So before we move forward, let's do a quick review on the prophetic program, our first objective uh, to look at the, pro the prophecies versus the mysteries, the prophetic program for Israel, the mystery program for the body of Christ. Now, in front of you on the screen is a chart, okay? And we're looking at the prophetic program for Israel. What do I mean by that? The prophetic program is everything that's been prophesied to happen to the nation of Israel. All in the Old Testament, the four Gospels, Hebrews through Revelation, from the birth of the nation of Israel, all the, to fulfill uh, all the promises and the covenants that God made with His people, the nation of Israel. Notice how the Bible is written. In the Old Testament, we see and we're made aware of that it is written to and for and about the nation of Israel. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, known as the four Gospels, again, it's written to and about the nation of Israel and about their kingdom program. In the book of Acts, the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's showing a transition from the fall of the nation of Israel and their kingdom program to the building up of Paul's gospel, the gospel of grace for the body of Christ, which is us. And Paul wrote 13 books, Romans through Philemon, and that's about the body of Christ for today. And then we see Hebrews through Revelation after the rapture, these books are written to the tribulation saints in Daniel's 70th week. It talks all about the second coming into the 1000 year reign. Now, notice something missing on this particular chart in front of you. What's missing is the dispensation of grace. The mystery gospel revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ. Paul's 13 books, Romans through Philemon. What you're seeing now on this dispensation, this dispensations chart is what would have happened if the nation of Israel would have repented when Stephen prophesied that the day of the Lord was at hand and their coming kingdom was at hand. Notice it's the same gospel that John the Baptist, the twelve apostles, and Jesus our Lord were preaching during that time. They were saying, Behold, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. What kingdom was John talking about? John was saying, Listen, guys, the day of the Lord is at hand. And the kingdom that's been prophesied from the days of old is about to begin because our Messiah is here now. Jesus being their Messiah. But they couldn't see it. You see, they were blinded by following the laws. They were law-minded. If you notice where Stephen is positioned on this chart, take note that the very next thing to take place here is Daniel's 70th week, the day of the Lord, and the second coming, and so on. You see, this chart represents what would have happened without the body of Christ involved. Everything on this chart is about the nation of Israel and the coming kingdom. Even if you notice the books of Hebrews to Revelation and 
Daniel's 70th week or the seven year tribulation period as some people know it and the 1000 year millennial reign this is their program going back from the left we start with Adam and Eve then you see Abraham and the promise it rises all the way up God raises Israel and you notice at the bottom that the Gentiles are left at the bottom and God chooses a particular people known as the Israelites and he raises them up and then we see Moses given the law and David and John the Baptist who came proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand and then we see our Lord and then we see the cross and we see the resurrection and we see Peter who was still preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the twelve were still and the others were still preaching the same message and then we see Stephen who was their last prophet we know that they killed Stephen by stoning him so things changed but on this chart what I want you to realize and see is that if they would have accepted Stephen's message to them and the nation of Israel would have repented as a nation they would have immediately gone into Daniel's 70th week it's extremely important to see this this is part of understanding dispensations you have to understand what would have happened if the nation of Israel would have turned away from the law repented of their ways and believed on Jesus Christ as our Messiah as a nation then we see Stephen he would have stayed alive he would have been you know prophesying he would have been preaching the gospels of the kingdoms at hand and then Daniel 70th week would have come in now notice that everything in Daniel 70th week and everything in the book of Revelation would have existed even without the body of Christ all the things that John saw all the, the that was revealed to him were things prophesied to Daniel so even without the body of Christ we see Daniel 70th week we see the things that go on in, in the book of Revelation the angels the seven trumpets the seven vials and so on all those things would have taken place still even if Israel would have repented and accepted Jesus still they would have had to go through Daniel's 70th week and the reason why they would have had to go through it is because it was prophesied God doesn't cancel his prophecies once he prophesies something it surely will come to be his word is carried through to the end always so keep this in mind that in Daniel's 70th week would have happened now at the end of Daniel's 70th week at the end of the tribulation period there would have been a resurrection well this is what the study is about who was being ra would have been raised at the end of Daniel's 70th week it would have been the Old Testament Saints or the Saints that went through Daniel's 70th week right now remember the body of Christ isn't in this picture that that I'm painting for you okay we're, we're not found anywhere in this so all the stuff that you read in Revelation is about the nation of Israel and that tells you something it tells you that when other people are telling you that the the body of Christ can be seen in the book of Revelation it's a lie it is a wicked lie to deceive you from the truth and it will it will confuse you when you put the body of Christ in the nation of Israel's programs and once you understand dispensation and right division all of this becomes really clear to you and suddenly it all makes sense you see so keeping that in mind without the body of Christ being involved there would have been Daniel 70th week there would have been people raised resurrected at the end of Daniel 70th week at the second coming all right so keep this in mind as we move on now in this next chart we notice that 
something changed. We see what happened when Israel rejected their Messiah. We see what happened when they killed Stephen, their last prophet. God puts a hold on the prophetic program, the nation of Israel's program, the kingdom gospel, and he reveals something new to a Hebrew of Hebrews named Saul. And this new thing is what we know as the gospel of grace. It was kept a mystery within God from the nation of Israel, from the Old Testament prophets, from everyone, even the angels, even Satan. God kept a secret within himself. And he revealed this secret, these mysteries, only when the, the nation of Israel completely rejected him and they killed Stephen. So after they kill Stephen, God chooses a, 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 a man named Saul who becomes the Apostle Paul. And Paul is the first person to receive the revelation of the gospel of grace. Now, a couple of things that are very important to understand is that the mystery of the gospel of grace, again, had never been known before Paul. And within the mystery program are other mysteries that were, were revealed to Paul throughout his ministry of 30 plus years. And one of those mysteries that was revealed to Paul is the rapture or the catching away or the harpazo of the body of Christ. Also, the judgment seat of Christ was another mystery. And the building of a body of members, the body of Christ, making us fellow heirs with the Son, that was another mystery. In other words, there's a list of mysteries, things never revealed before the to the nation of Israel, things never mentioned by the prophecies that suddenly were revealed to Apostle Paul. A completely new gospel, one separate from the kingdom gospel, and one designed to save everyone, both Jews and Gentiles, together in one body of believers. Now, under the prophetic program, Israel is promised the earthly kingdom. You see, the kingdom that Jesus Christ brings with him at the second coming is called the heavenly kingdom or the kingdom of heaven. Well, when Jesus Christ brings it with him at the second coming, he, t he places this kingdom of heaven on the earth and it is the earthly kingdom that is promised to the nation of Israel through the covenant and through the prophecies. It's nothing new. The nation of Israel were told for thousands and thousands of years that they would inherit the earthly kingdom one day in the future. So that's not part of the mystery program revealed to Paul. Okay? And under the mystery program, the body of Christ is promised the heavenly program. Not the kingdom of heaven. We're promised the heavenly program in the heavens. God never promised us the body of Christ an earthly kingdom. Not once. Not once, my friends. The rapture was something new that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. It's one of the mysteries in the new gospel of grace. Salvation without the law, but by grace through faith alone. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 52 now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Pay careful attention to verse 51. Paul says, I show you a mystery, something that was never known before, something that had never been prophesied before. This is something different here that we're looking at and something new outside of the prophetic program. We know the prophecies prophesied hundreds, uh, I'm sorry, the prophets prophesied hundreds of times concerning the resurrection of the saints at the second coming. So obviously 
the resurrection at the second coming wasn't a mystery. They already knew. See, the nation of Israel and the prophets, they knew, they were made fully aware, and they knew that someday at the second coming, there would be a massive resurrection, and they would be take, resur uh, raised from the, the grave. They, they knew this. So, that's not part of the mystery. But this rapture thing is the mystery. That's what Paul was saying. Behold, I'm showing you something that's never been revealed before. Something new. So, that points to, to really two things. First of all, if it's something new, then obviously it can't be part of the second coming. And it can't be part of when the Old Testament saints are raised from the dead. It can't be. Because the rapture, Paul says, it was a mystery. It is something new. Right? What Paul mentioned here, it's different. Something other than the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. And the same saints that go through Daniel's 70th week. They're considered the Old Testament saints. Okay? This mystery that Paul speaks about here concerns us, the body of Christ. Not the Old Testament saints. They're not part of our program. They have a different resurrection. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He's saying, I know you don't know this, but I'm going to tell you something so that you're made aware of it. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's telling them part of this mystery, what's going to happen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Notice in verse 16, the trump of God. Some people say, look, these are the trumpets in the book of Revelations. This, my friends, says it is the trump of God. The seventh trumpet blown in Revelation is blown by an angel and it's a literal trumpet here we see the trump of God not the trumpet of God the phrase trump of God here in, in, in the context means the sounding of God or the calling of God or the shout of God when God shouts his commands every atom in the universe listens and obeys God shouts with a voice of an archangel with power and authority this reminds me of when Lazarus was raised from the dead when we look at Lord, what our Lord Jesus Christ says he shouted loudly Lazarus come forth and Lazarus was raised from the dead I think there's a specific reason why Jesus used his name Lazarus he didn't have to, but he chose to say, Lazarus, come forth. He was specific in his command, and only Lazarus was raised from the dead. In John eleven forty three to 44 and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with graves closed, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. There's no mistake that Lazarus was dead. Completely dead. Now, when God shouts with the reverberation of a trumpet, the booming, echoing of a powerful command, the dead will rise and will be changed immediately. Notice the context of what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians 4. He's speaking about the mystery, not a prophecy, okay? Also, before I forget, and this is something I think we need to at least touch on. 
There's a teaching out there that says that the body of Christ will be raptured or caught up on the Feast of Trumpets. And they use what Paul says about the last trump to back up their, that theory. Now, according to the traditions of the Feast of Trumpets, the very last sounding of the trumpet is done at an hour that nobody knows. And it has to do with the phase of the moon. Uh, it's the 100th trumpet blast, which ends the Feast of Trumpets. And it's commonly called the last trumpet. Now, on the surface, it sounds convincing because there seems to be a correlation with the phrases last trump and the hour that no man knoweth. However, when you rightly divide, when you look at God's word dispensationally, there's a problem with this theory of the Feast of Trumpets rapture, and here's why. Looking back at our chart, before the body of Christ was formed, the mystery gospel, which was revealed to Paul, before the body of Christ was created, we still have the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was created long before the body of Christ was. Way before Paul's conversion. Way before Jesus' crucifixion. Way before the birth of Jesus. They were celebrating the Feast of Trumpets a long, long, long time ago. And they were celebrating this feast in the nation of Israel. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ. This Feast of Trumpets represents the resurrection that happens after Daniel's 70th week. It's really that simple. It can't be what Paul revealed because Paul revealed a mystery that was never known before. You see, when we make the body of Christ part of nation, uh, the nation of Israel's prophecies and so forth, when we do that, we call Paul a liar. We call Jesus a liar. We call God a liar. And we know they're not liars. So we need to ask the question, why? Why were they celebrating the Feast of Trumpets back then? Well, we know all the feasts are rehearsals for some future event between God and the nation of Israel. The Feast of Trumpets was part of the nation of Israel since God told Israel to create their feasts. So the feasts, all of them, are all about prophecies, Israel's prophecies. So what exactly is being rehearsed at the celebration of the Feast of Trumpets? Again, the Israelites knew full well what the celebration meant. It was part of the prophecies revealed to them in Numbers 29.1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Leviticus 23.23-25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Numbers 10, 8. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. Now here's the most important question. Keeping right division in mind, keeping dispensations in mind, knowing that the body of Christ was a secret, not revealed until Paul was converted and he was shown the mystery of the creation of the body of Christ, knowing that we, the body of Christ, was a secret kept from the world when the Feast of Trumpets was created, then how can the Feast of Trumpets have anything to do with us, the body of Christ? Paul tells us clearly over and over again that the gospel of grace was a mystery revealed to him, to Paul, by Jesus Christ himself. Look at Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began in 1 Corinthians 2 7 8 but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew for had they known it they would have not crucified the Lord of glory the mystery gospel the secret 
hidden in the Lord since the foundation of creation was so secret that not one of the sons of men knew it existed. Look here at Ephesians 3 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Galatians 1 11 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. One thing that wasn't a secret, however, were the prophecies of the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. It's the resurrection of the Old Testament saints and the end of Daniel's 70th week. The nation of Israel knew full well that one day the saints would rise from the dead and reign on earth. This is what we know today as the Kingdom Program. The Feast of Trumpets has to do with the Kingdom Program for the nation of Israel, not the body of Christ. The Feast of Trumpets is not part of the mystery. It wasn't revealed to Paul. It wasn't something new. It's part of the prophetic program for the nation of Israel. And we know the last three feasts will be fulfilled with the second coming of our Lord Jesus. At some point in the future, on the Feast of Trumpets, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected to reign with Christ Jesus on the earth. This has nothing to do with the rapture of the body of Christ. You see, our gathering, the rapture, is an event that will happen without notice. It's not a prophecy. The rapture is part of the mystery program, not part of the kingdom program. Paul knew full well that the day or that day could happen at any moment. Actually, he thought it was going to happen in his day. Keep in mind, there are no blowing of trumpets at, at the rapture. Paul tells us that the trump of God, meaning the voice or the shout of God, the saints will be gathered in the air and so on. God's not going to be up there blowing a trumpet, my friends. <laughs> Paul said the trump of God. It's the voice. It's his voice. Paul could have said God's, his voice will sound. But back then they used the, uh, the trump will sound. Or the sound, uh, you know, the trump of God, the voice of God, the sounding of God, and so forth. There's no trumpets for the rapture. Those that teach that the rapture is going to take place during the Feast of Trumpets are taking things way out of context. They're twisting scripture. They're making it sound like God is blowing a trumpet or at the last trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets, then the rapture happens and so forth. This is grossly out of context. And it's irresponsible. And it's actually rapture date, you know, predicting the rapture, setting dates. That's what they're doing. Because when you convince a bunch of people that the rapture has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, well, guess what happens when the Feast of Trumpets was over yesterday? You see, these people think that there's no way the rapture is going to happen for another year. And a lot of them fall backwards in, in their relationship with the Lord. A lot of them do. And a lot of them end up in depression. And a lot of them feel insecure about their salvation. You see, this comes from the enemy. Because God doesn't cause confusion. God's word is truth. So, and you'll notice that the people teaching things like this the Feast of Trumpets Rapture are also teaching other confusions and other false doctrines, like calling the body of Christ the bride, also believing in the partial rapture theory, also believing in teaching that we turn to angels in heaven and we're coming back with Jesus Christ at the second coming, and the list of heresy goes on and on and on, one false teaching snowballing into another. You see, there's people out there that teach 
that we're coming back with Jesus. We're, we're coming back with Jesus Christ at the second coming. And what they do is they use the, the passage where it says that they see the Lord in heaven riding on a horse and there's an army with him. And they say that this army is the church. They say it's the body of Christ, the bride. They call us the bride. We're not the bride. But they teach that, you know, we're coming back with Jesus Christ. But when you show them that these beings that were with Jesus Christ at the second coming are actually angels, they see the scripture with their own eyes. Oh, yeah, you're right. They are angels. Well, then guess what? I bet you we become angels when we're raptured up. I bet you we turn into angels in heaven. That's it. We turn to angels. That's why we're coming back with Jesus. That's why it says there's angels coming back with Jesus at the second coming. You see how twisted it is? It's one false lie into another false lie. It's snowballing false doctrine into another one, into another one, into another one. It's a great big web of lies. Listen, friends. First of all, I have videos all throughout my channel. You can look through them. I have videos on who is the bride of Christ, okay? Uh, who is coming back with Jesus at the second coming? Who are the, in heaven? Who are the, who is the army with Jesus at the second coming? And so forth. I've got videos on all this stuff. So please take advantage of them. Learn the truth. Learn right division. Learn what's going to happen. So it's all by right division. It's so important. And when you ignore how the Bible is written, you know, these you're gonna you're gonna fall for all the snares and traps of these people who make up doctrines based on their opinions instead of what the Bible says. It's very dangerous. So I really wanted to cover that the false teaching. Everyone's so you're aware you're made aware of it, and I wanted to show you why it's false. And now that you know the truth by rightly dividing, you can point out to others. That you know, you can tell them, look, you know, th this thing can't, this this feast of trumpets rapture cannot be true, because the feast of trumpets isn't part of the the mystery. It was part of the prophecy program, so it has to be for them, and it has to happen at the resurrection. It makes perfect sense. The blowing on the feast of trumpets will rot. The 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 old, they're going to be raised from the dead. That's when it's going to happen. And then the other feasts are going to fall accordingly and, be, and they're going to be fulfilled too. We have the Feast of Atonement and then we have the Feast of Tabernacle when the, our Lord Jesus is actually with us. He's tabernacling with, uh, not us, but he's tabernacling with the nation of Israel. Now notice what Jesus Christ says in Matthew twenty-five thirty-four, in reference to the earthly kingdom. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The promise of God's earthly kingdom goes all the way back to Adam and it continues with the nation of Israel from Genesis onward until we come to the Apostle Paul. And after they reject the prophet Stephen and they kill him, then we see God pausing that kingdom program, the prophecy program, God pauses that and then he reveals to Paul the mystery program. That's us, the creation of the body of Christ, containing both Jews and Gentiles, one body made up of many members. Then, when the body of Christ is removed at the rapture, God restarts the kingdom program once again with Daniel, with Daniel's 70th week or the seven year tribulation period, as some know it. So let me pull up that chart real quick. We're looking at this, I'm looking at this one. We see the stoning of Stephen. We see the God pressing pause on the kingdom program. He rises up Paul and he rises up the body of Christ. And you see the nation of Israel falling to the bottom. Romans through Philemon, it's all about the body of Christ. And then after that, we see the rapture taking place. So the body of Christ is gone. Then you, you, you see God rising the nation of Israel back up again to go through Daniel's 70th week. So God goes from prophecy 
to mystery, back to fulfilling the prophecies once again. Understanding that all the prophecies must be fulfilled to the letter. The oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, makes it clear that they had the hope of one day being resurrected in the flesh and ruling with Christ Jesus on the earth. Look at Job 19, 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Okay, we're, we're talking about the second coming and the earthly kingdom. And though, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Well, how is he going to do that? He's going to be resurrected at the end of Daniel's 70th week at the sounding of the Feast of Trumpets. Whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold and not another though my reins be consumed within me. Every single person that's saved outside of our, our program today, meaning everyone before Paul and everyone after the rapture falls under the prophetic program. And they're all going to be resurrected at the second coming. And these saints who are, who are resurrected are going to be ushered into the earthly kingdom, ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus for 1,000 years. Revelation 20, 4-6. And I saw thrones, and they, that they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. Neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And these are the tribulation saints, part of the kingdom program, part of the prophetic program that were going through Daniel's 70th week, and they were killed. They were martyred, or they died a natural death. That's who... That's what this passage is talking about. Revelation 20, 4-6. It's not talking about the body of Christ, friends. In verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We're talking, about, we're talking about, again, the Old Testament saints and the saints that go through the tribulation period. They're literally going to be resurrected at the end, at the second coming, and they're going to be with Jesus Christ on the earth, reigning for a thousand years. There's, we're not talking about the body of Christ, dear friends. If you look at my video, look at the video that I made uh, I believe the name of it is Behold Who Are the Ones Coming Back with Jesus. Take a look at that video. After, the, after you watch that, you're going to understand what happens to us after the rapture. Now, according to Jesus Christ, Israel's patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are going to be resurrected to enter and reign in the earthly kingdom. Obviously, their resurrection has to be before the 1,000 years begin, right? Look at Matthew 8, 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Note here that the kingdom of heaven is the earthly kingdom brought with Jesus Christ to the earth. Sometimes people get confused when they hear the kingdom of heaven. They think it's in heaven. But as far as the context is, is we're looking at the context here. In God's word the kingdom of heaven is the one that Jesus brings and establishes upon the earth for the nation of Israel it's the earthly kingdom promised to them it's promised to them by covenant it's not promised to the body of Christ we have many other promises also we know that the 12 apostles are going to rule and reign with Christ on the earth in the earthly kingdom as well so obviously they need to be resurrected at the second coming right Matthew 19 27 30 then answered Peter and said unto him behold we have forsaken all and followed thee 
What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my namesake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and last shall be first. So Jesus is telling them, you guys are going to be on the earth with me, ruling and reigning over the twelve tribes of Israel. And in order for them to be on the earth, ruling and reigning over the twelve tribes, well, guess what? They need to be resurrected because these people are their bodies are in the grave. So we see the resurrection at the second coming of the Old Testament saints, not the body of Christ. God's word gives us some clues as to when the Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected. In Daniel 12, 11 to 13, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up there shall be a thousand two hundred ninety days blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty six days but go thy way till the end be for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days so we see here by rightly dividing that all the Old Testament saints will be resurrected after Daniel's 70th week, sometime during or right before the second coming of our Lord Jesus. In my opinion on this, on when the Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected, is most likely right after the second coming, after the angels get rid of the tares, all the unbelievers, and after the angels get rid of, or after the angels gather all the believers into the earthly kingdom, then the Old Testament saints are going to be resurrected and they're, they're going to be placed over the 12 tribes to rule and reign. I could be off by a couple months, but I think I'm pretty close. And if anybody has any scriptural proof, or if anybody out there has studied this in depth of exactly when the Old Testament saints are raised, you know, what month and day, that specificness of it, please share it with me. I'd, I'd love to know. So, you know, for future studies. So in this study, we've looked at the second coming of Christ Jesus. We looked at the resurrection prophecies given to the nation of Israel, the Old Testament saints and the saints going through the tribulation period. We've looked at the prophetic program versus the mystery program. We looked at who the saints uh, will be ruling with Christ Jesus on the earth when the Old Testament saints are resurrected. And we talked a little bit about the Feast of Trumpets not being for the body of Christ, not being the rapture. For most of you watching, you're probably already familiar with dispensations. But if for some reason you're not, please look through my videos and find the series on the seven dispensations. At a minimum, the very least, watch the sixth and seventh video. The sixth one is on the dispensation of grace and which is for today. And the seventh is all about the dispensation of the kingdom, the 70th week of Daniel, commonly known as the seven-year tribulation period. So I'll tell you this, and I promise you, anyone who rightly divides and understands dispensations will also tell you that without understanding dispensations, it's impossible to understand the Bible. Impossible. It's that important. All right, saints, thanks for studying with me. Peace, grace, and love in Christ Jesus be with all of you. Stay warm this winter. And my friends, pray for me. Please keep me in your prayers. Making videos and teaching and studying is a ministry, and it's hard. And so I need your prayers. I need you to pray that God would increase my wisdom, knowledge, discernment understanding of his word increase the understanding especially in the mysteries revealed to Paul pray for my protection against the attacks from the enemy and the wicked ones uh, things are going to get worse and worse as we get closer to our rapture so with that I shall see you on the next study Lord willing